We are in the book of Joshua. As we are continuing our <clears throat> studies through the Bible, we're studying um, through the Bible. We started in Genesis 1-1, and we're making our way through, and we're just starting the book of Joshua. This is an exciting, exciting book. I like the book of Joshua. I like the, the Joshua is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And so we're going to learn a lot, I believe, out of this book and maybe some things that now you wouldn't expect uh, to learn out of the book of Joshua as we go through it. Um, today, I, I do want to give you some more um, preliminary thoughts into the book. As last week we did some of that and we went into chapter number one. Um, today I want to talk to you specifically about Joshua and a little bit of Joshua himself, his background, um, and... Uh, um, how the Lord has called him and used him. Uh, and I, I believe this will be helpful for us as we get into um, this book, as we, we look at the man Joshua and uh, the Lord working and using his life. And so um, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson this morning. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with. Lord, thank you for uh, this wonderful day you've given to us. Lord, I pray that you would help us as we look at your word, Lord. I pray that it would make a difference in our hearts and lives. And uh, Lord, I pray right now, Lord, that you would fill me with your spirit and use me at this time as we get into your word and we are in this Sunday school class. And I pray that it would be an opportunity for us to uh, make a decision for you, possibly, or, or just learn more of you and be used of you. Help us, Lord, to lift your name. Help us to bring glory and honor to you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for all that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about Joshua. I'm not sure that we'll get into chapter number two at all today. Last week we did talk and go through uh, chapter number one, and we did give some uh, preliminary comments or thoughts or ideas, and then went right into chapter number one. Um, as I was taking the opportunity to study this week and to get pre and preparing for this particular Sunday school class, I um, thought more and more about Joshua and and who he was. And uh, so I want to talk to you a little bit um, today about the man Joshua, uh, as we are be just beginning to get into the book of Joshua. And so. Um, uh, several things here as we look at Joshua's background and in Joshua's life. Um, the word Joshua means the Lord is salvation. Um, uh, so the Lord, the word Joshua, the name Joshua means the Lord is salvation, or Jehovah is salvation. And uh, the, the word Joshua in the Hebrew, um, Joshua is in the Hebrew form. Um, uh, the word Joshua, the name Joshua in the Greek form is Jesus. And so we have the word Joshua, Jehesh, Jehoshua, we'll see that actually spelt that way, Jehoshua, in just a moment as, as he is introduced in, in one place in the, in place in the Bible. Um, that word um, Jehovah is salvation, or the Lord is salvation, now the Greek word of Jehoshua being Jesus. Joshua is a type of the Savior. Now, I do believe that the Bible teaches... Um, uh, in uh, that we can learn, and pardon me, I say that, that we can learn from God's word through types and through pictures. Um, uh, and uh, oftentimes, as you read, someone once said that the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, and the Old Testament, the New Testament concealed. And there are times you see things in the Old Testament that remind you or makes you think of the Lord Jesus Christ, or um, somehow you, you think I see Christ in that. And I believe that by design. I believe the Lord has put that in his word. Um, uh, you cannot help but think of that when you get to Genesis 22. And uh, Abram takes his son Isaac. Abraham takes his son Isaac uh, to sacrifice him as God has commanded him to do so. And there's so many parallels between that and the Lord Jesus Christ giving up himself. Uh, and and uh, the father... Um, sacrificing the son for the sins of the world. And so that kind of thing where you see um, things in the Old Testament, they seem to be a picture of something much greater. Uh, you see that a lot in the Bible. In fact, the Bible says in Hosea, let me, think, let me think if I can find the book of Hosea. 
<laughs> and I, th I think it's Hosea chapter number 12, verse number, Hosea 12, 10 says, I have also spoken by the prophets and have multiplied visions and used similitudes by the ministry of the prophets. That word similitudes or the idea of um, types in the Bible. Okay, We see that throughout scripture. Sometimes when you come across a difficult passage of scripture in the Old Testament, you think to yourself, what, what was that for? This seems kind of random. It seems like it just it was put in there for no reason. Uh, sometimes you put the Lord Jesus Christ in the middle of it, and you, it kind of it all kind of makes sense. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joshua himself, I believe, is a picture or a type of Christ, a type of our Savior, um, in in several ways. Um, Joshua is a prophet. Okay, he foretells of God's plan. Um, Joshua is a priest, not formally because he is from the tribe of Ephraim, um, but he is Moses' minister, uh, and so we see. In these ways, uh, this is how Joshua is like Christ. Um, Joshua is a military commander, and you can't help but see that as we get into the book of Joshua, and we go into the uh, the battles that they will go into. Um, Joshua is now leading the children of Israel in a very uh, military commander type of position, uh, and of course Jesus is the unseen captain, and the Lord, of course, is our captain in the spiritual battle that we are in. Um, Jesus is the unseen captain of chapter number five. Joshua will come across a soldier in Joshua chapter number five. Uh, and he will not recognize who he is at first. But then as he realizes who he is, and we can turn there quickly, actually, Joshua chapter five. Starting in verse number 13, this is before they're about to go into the battle of Jericho. And Joshua, I'm sure, is contemplating what he's about to go into, and um, as anybody would, he's, his mind is probably preoccupied with making sure everything is in place and they're ready to go and following God's orders. Maybe Jericho is sort of the backdrop, as he can see over where he is from, over to where Jericho is at. And as he is the night before, or before they go into this battle of Jericho, as he is um, walking by himself, the Bible says in verse number 13, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lift up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Art thou for us or for our adversary? So he sees this soldier type person, and he says, Who, Whose side are you on? Are you for us or are you for our adversary? Verse number 14, And he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord am I now come. And so here we have, he introduces himself as the captain of the host of the Lord. Uh, and we see this introduction of this individual that Joshua sees as a captain of the host of the Lord, some sort of a military commander type. But notice what Joshua does in the second half of the verse. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? Joshua immediately recognized who he was as he began to talk with him, as he heard the voice of the Lord. Now, that is an interesting study, by the way. Um, how many people recognize the Lord once they hear his voice? Remember that Mary when, went down to the tomb and she did she suppose him to be he the gardener? Asked where the body was taken, and then when he said her name, he recognized she recognized who he was. And so when Joshua hears his voice and he begins to speak, he realizes who he is, and what does he do? He falls to the earth and he, he begins to worship and said unto him, What saith my Lord unto his servant? So he automatically begins to worship him. Now you'll notice in the Bible, when you have angels that come down, and that does occasionally happen, where an angel will come down and deal with man, um, angels will never accept worship uh, because they're they're not to be worshipped. And so you'll see in the Bible, they won't accept worship. If, if, if an angel comes down, an angel of the Lord, the Bible says, comes down and accepts worship, that is a clue uh, to us that this isn't just any old angel. This is the Lord Jesus Christ coming down pre-incarnate. Before he comes down to the earth in the form of a man, he shows up once in a while. And so here's one of those times. And, and of course, Joshua worships him uh, because this is a pre-incarnate form of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And what do they say in verse number 15? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place whereon thou st <coughs> excuse me, standest is holy. And Joshua did so. Uh, and so here we have um, Joshua worshiping 
um, the captain of the host, and this is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so Joshua himself is a military commander, but we see Christ here also as a, a captain of the host, a military commander himself. Okay, Joshua came after Moses, which is interesting, um, for what the law could not do, Jesus completed. Moses was never allowed to enter into the promised land. Moses representing the law. Joshua, however, was able to bring the children of Israel into the promised land, which is a type of the victorious Christian life. And we can have victory in our life with the Lord Jesus Christ and what the law could not do. The Lord Jesus Christ can. So uh, praise the Lord for that. Joshua came after Moses and what the law could not do. Jesus completed. Joshua leads to victory as Christ does for the believer. Um, we can have victory in our Christian life and that there's an overall lesson to be learned from the book of Joshua. It is the fact that we can have victory in our Christian life. We can live a victorious Christian life. God can make a difference and use every one of us and we can have that victory. Um, uh, and, and Joshua leads the children of Israel into um, uh, victory as Christ leads us into victory. It's an interesting study to see when do they not have victory? Who can tell me what battle it is? They don't have victory. Ai, very good. So what happened in Ai, what's the overall problem? Really it happened in Ai that caused them not to have victory. That is disobedience. When Achan did not obey and took stuff that he wasn't supposed to take, the cursed thing. We don't have victory in our lives when we are disobedient to the Lord. Um, we can have victory in our life if we are obedient to God and we follow his commandments. Um, I, I'm growing weary of many people that I know that I went to Bible college with that uh, knew right from wrong who are uh, veering off to the left and being part of churches that have no standards and no convictions and, uh, and, and they're just, the church to them is just becoming um, a place of entertainment and and it, it burdens me that people don't understand that we have to read God's word, know God's word, be obedient to God's word. And as we are, God will give us a life of victory. So, okay, we can have victory in our Christian life. Um, Jesus leads, uh, sorry, Joshua leads to victory as Christ did for the, does for the believer. Jesus is uh, our advocate after we suffer defeat, just as Joshua was for Israel after Ai and other places that they were defeated. Uh, and so Christ, of course, is our advocate. We can always come to Christ after we've been defeated. You and I are no doubt in a spiritual battle. There's no doubt about that. And uh, Satan uses all kinds of tactics in this spiritual battle to try to hurt us. You ever wonder sometimes when you struggle with your thought life and it just seems like some days are worse than others? You say, boy, it just seems for some reason today I'm just having a problem with bad thoughts. I'm just thinking bad about somebody and they're just on my mind a lot today. Not every day. Like, it just seems like today it seems to be worse. You ever think to yourself, maybe there's some sort of satanic influence that's causing that because we're in a spiritual battle? Why am I struggling so much today? Well, part of it might be you're allowing yourself to get into temptations and you're allowing yourself to dwell in something. There's no doubt about that. No doubt our flesh, you know, causes us to make things even worse. But possibly uh, there's a spiritual battle going on that can even affect our minds as, you know, demonic forces that cause us to think certain ways. And rather than come to the Lord with that, we find ourselves uh, being defeated. But even if we are defeated, we can always come back into the battle. And Jesus is our advocate after we suffer defeat. And we see Joshua as well being the advocate for Israel after they are defeated. At the end of Joshua, at the end of the book of Joshua, he allocates Israel's inheritance just as Christ will at his second coming. Uh, and we're going to see an interesting parallels between some of those things as we get into the book of Joshua. So we see in a lot of ways and probably other ways as well where Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so um, uh, we see him as a type of our Savior. Uh, Joshua is a man that is called of God. And we see that in the Bible. Joshua is somebody that is now being used of God, and he was called of God to do what he did. He is called, prepared, and obedient. And we see all these things in 
uh, in, in Scripture. Joshua is a man called of God. He is called, prepared, and obedient. As the eldest son of uh, Nun, Nun, whatever her name is, <laughs> uh, Joshua's son of Nun, as the eldest son of Nun, he, uh, he had a very special interest in the Passover. Remember when they left Egypt, being the oldest son, um, I would imagine he had a very special interest that they do this right because he would have been the one in that family that would have been killed um, had they not put the blood on the doorpost and, and sacrificed the lamb like they were supposed to. Um, so he had a very special interest in the Passover, um, being the firstborn son. Joshua first comes on the scene in the Bible in Exodus chapter number 17. Let's take a look at that. Exodus chapter number 17. This is the first place where we see Joshua. And we see the kind of guy that Joshua is as we get into um, uh, Exodus chapter number 17. The Bible talks about um, uh, uh, Moses in the beginning of the chapter. Moses uh, brings water for them to drink. Uh, Exodus 17, verse number 5, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, uh, and thy rod, and wherewith thou smotest the river. Take it unto thy hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before there with upon the rock of Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he smote the rock. There a great miracle took place here. Um, and water came out. Just after that, in verse number 8, right after they receive water from the rock, okay, they go into battle. We see the first mention of Amalek as well here. Chapter number uh, 17, verse number 8. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Raphidim. This is shortly after they've left Egypt. And they're going into a battle because Amalek has come up after them. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men and go out fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So here we have right off the bat somebody that Moses can trust. He can say, um, listen, uh, we need to go into this battle um, and we need you to gather to, uh, some men together to go into this battle, into this fight. So right off the bat, when we see the character of Joshua in the Bible, we see that he is entrusted to gather men together to go into lead the battle. Um, uh, verse number 10, so Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up into the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And so we hear a Aaron and her holding up the hands of Moses so that there could be victory. Because as he had his hands up, there was great victory over Amalek. As his hands would fall down, they begin to see defeat. And so Aaron and her held up the arms of Moses so that he could keep his hands up. And the Bible says in verse number 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So Joshua led them in the battle and began to have victory over them. And the Bible says discomfited them. Um, and then we see something interesting in verse number 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book. Now, Moses is keeping track of what's happening. In fact, what he ends up writing is the first five books of the Bible. So here we have this book that Moses is writing in. Um, and in this book, as part of this book that we know as, as the, the law of God, the first five books of the Bible, um, he says, uh, write for this memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. I want you to record what is happening, and I want you to make sure Joshua sees this law, sees the book, and sees what is happening. Moses is told to write down what takes place in a book to be for Joshua to hear later. This is a glimpse of Joshua being groomed to lead someday. There's an interest on the side of God to say, make sure you record this. And as you record this, part of the reason for this is that I want Joshua to see it. I want Joshua to know what you're recording and having in your book. Okay. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And of course, eventually um, he does do that. 
uh, puts out uh, Amalek completely as he said he would. So here we have Joshua first appearing in Exodus chapter number 17. He is um, used right away uh, and very obedient as Moses gives him instruction. And we can see a glimpse, a small glimpse of the fact that God's going to use Joshua and use Moses to mold Joshua to be the next leader. Um, Joshua went up with Moses to Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter number 19, just a page over here. Exodus chapter number 19, when um, Moses goes up into the mount, uh, verse number 3, and Moses went up to the mount of God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say unto the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did and the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Uh, and ye shall be a, unto me a kingdom of um, priests and, and holy nation. Uh, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So God is giving Moses specific words to say and telling him what to tell them. Uh, verse number seven, and Moses uh, came and called for the elders of the people and laid before their face all these words which the Lord commanded him. Uh, and all the people uh, answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. So now the Lord is speaking uh, to Moses in the mountain, uh, and then he's bringing the word of God down to them. Um, we see in Exodus, let's see here, let's look at Exodus 30. Three. Um, Exodus thirty two. This is where Moses received the law up in the mountain, and when the people saw the most delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron. So Exodus 32, we see that Moses is up in the mountain talking to God, um, and he is up there. We will find out later for 40 days, and as he delayed up there, the people become anxious, and they begin to throw a party, and they ask Aaron to make them some sort of a golden image. And so Aaron takes all their earrings and all their gold and melts it into this calf inside this giant furnace that they had, and and, uh, and this calf comes out. There's possibly uh, some kind of satanic involvement in this. At any rate, all the people begin to dance and party while Moses is up in the mountain. As Moses is coming down, he becomes very upset with them. Um, he finds out that they are partying down there and having a good time while he's gone in direct violation to God's word. Uh, and so Moses is going to become very upset. You understand the story. Verse number 15 and Moses turned and went down from the mount, and the two tables of testimony were in his hand. The tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other uh, were they written. And the tables were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there is a noise of war in the camp. So as Moses is coming down out of the mountain, having met with God. He's not down to the people yet, but yet he's coming down out of the mountain, and who is there with him? Joshua. Joshua is there. Um, the Bible says in uh, verse number 17, and when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he could hear them, what they were doing down there. So was Joshua up there where he was the whole time, or was he somewhere in the middle? I guess I've always thought he was somewhere on the mountain, sort of waiting for Moses to come down. Um, but the Bible says, And Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted. He said unto Moses, There is a noise of war in the camp. And he said, It is not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither it is the voice of them that cry for being overcome. But the noise of them that do sing, do I hear. Um, so Joshua is there with Moses as God is getting um, these tables, uh, uh, tablets written on from the finger of God. God. Joshua is somehow there with them as they were coming down off of the mountain. You remember that Moses becomes very upset and very um, uh, 
mad with the people when he comes down and he, he breaks the two tables of stone and he says that famous statement, you know, who was on the Lord's side and then the Levites all come and join him and he uses the Levites to do a great judgment on them and, and then chapter 33 is after that great judgment and they have a tabernacle set up and all the people are making their way out to the tabernacle, the people that are left that haven't been slain after this great judgment and they are sort of getting right with the Lord and all of a sudden Moses himself gets up out of his tent to go over to the tabernacle. Verse number 7. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the camp, afar off from the camp, and called it the tabernacle of the congregation. And it came to pass that every one which sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which is without the camp. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. They could all watch Moses. You can imagine, they're all feeling like, you know, guilty. If everything they had done, they'd turned their backs on God. God brought down great judgment. And now Moses himself is walking on the tabernacle. They're all watching. What's going to happen? What, what, where, where's their future now? What's, what's happening? And Moses is making his way. You can picture the scene into the tabernacle there. Verse number nine, and it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. So here's Moses in the tabernacle and, and the cloud comes down and the Lord is speaking with Moses there in the tabernacle and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. I could imagine they were excited as they saw the Lord's not done with us. God is still talking to Moses. He's still is coming down in this, in this pillar of cloud. And so they're very thankful and they begin to worship every man in the tent door, the Bible said. They probably, wherever they happen to be standing, they realize this and they begin to worship the Lord. Verse number 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again into the camp. So he talks to God face to face. He gets up and he leaves. But something very interesting about this scene. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as the man speaketh unto a friend, and he turned again into the camp, but his servant, Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Joshua was in there, in that tabernacle, when Moses had this, this experience of seeing God face to face. And you've heard how Moses had this opportunity, and what an incredible scene that must have been. And everybody else had to watch from a distance, but Joshua was there. Uh, somehow Joshua was there in that tabernacle when all this took place. And the Bible says, but a servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. He was in there when this took place uh, with Moses. So jo Joshua um, somehow was in Mount Sinai when Moses was there. Joshua was in the tabernacle when God spoke to him face to face. Um, we see Joshua chosen and his name changed in Numbers chapter number 13. Take your Bible to the book of Numbers. Numbers 13. We have a list here of, of um, these 12 spies that are sent in. Numbers 13, verse number 1, And the Lord speaking to Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. For every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all those men were heads of the children of Israel. And so he began to choose men, one from each tribe of Israel, to go spy out the land. This is that Kadesh Barnea. Remember, they're going to come back. Ten were bad and two were good. They're going to come back and say, well, we shouldn't go in there except for two of them, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb said, man, we got to go in there. we got to we got to have victory here. We can have victory. we got to give us victory. The other ten said, no way, there's giants there. <laughs> there's no way we're going to go in. And so oftentimes I will, I have before, okay, verse number four says, and, there were the, uh, and these were the names of the tribe of Reuben, Chuma, Chumua, <laughs> the tribe of Simeon, verse number five, uh, Shaphat, verse number six, the tribe of Judah, Caleb, verse number seven, the tribe of Issachar, Egal. So I'll ask people sometimes, who's ever heard of Shuma, or who's ever heard of Shaphat, or who's ever heard of Egal, or who's ever heard of um, Palti, verse number nine, say, who's ever heard of these guys? A lot say, wow, those are weird Bible, they never heard of them. But then I'll say, well, who's ever heard of Joshua and Caleb? And everybody's like, oh, I've heard of them, Joshua and Caleb. All right? You're remembered when you follow the Lord. All these guys didn't do anything for the Lord, and no one remembers them. Uh, but yet Joshua and Caleb wanted to go in. They remember. But I want you to notice verse number 8. 
of the tribe of Ephraim, Ushia, Usha, the son of Nun, O-S-H-E-A. So here we have this guy named Ushia, the son of Nun. But then notice uh, verse number, well, let's see, verse number 16. These are the names of the men which Moses sent out to spy out the land. And Moses called Ushia, Usha, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. And Jehoshua, that is Joshua. So this Hebrew name Jehoshua is, um, means Jehovah is salvation. Ushia, O-S-H-E-A, means he saves. His name was changed from Ushia, he saves, to Jehoshua, Jehovah is salvation. Um, so his name is changed there, and Moses changes his name on purpose. Um, that name Jehoshua is a Hebrew name of the Greek name Jesus. In fact, in the New Testament, referring to Joshua, um, three different times he's called Jesus. Um, and let's see here, uh, my notes, in the New Testament, several times Joshua is called Jesus. Matthew one twenty one, Acts 7.45, Acts 7, of course, when Stephen brings his message to the Sanhedrin. Um, when he's supposed to be on trial, he pretty much turns it on them and puts them on trial. <laughs> what have you done with Christ? What have you done with the prophets? Um, uh, but in that sermon, uh, Acts chapter number 7, verse number 45, he refers to Joshua, and the Bible calls him Jesus. In Hebrews 4, 8, we see the same thing. Um, referring to Joshua, um, he is called Jesus. And so uh, another clue, by the way, that we have Joshua as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see Joshua here as a man used of God, called of God, uh, groomed by a leader, Moses. Uh, and so Joshua is the man that is called of God. He's called, prepared, and obedient. Um, and number 13 is the background of how the children of Israel got to the point where they are um, in Joshua chapter number 1. Um, and so because of number chapter 13, and they did not go in like they were supposed to, they ended up 40 years wandering in the wilderness. Uh, and then you get to the book of Joshua where they actually go in like they're supposed to they're actually go into um uh, uh conquer the land and so um uh, joshua and caleb wanted to enter in the promised land at kadesh barnea notice number chapter number 14 the next chapter over verse number six through nine and joshua the son of nun and caleb the son of jephuna which were of these which are of them that searched the land rent their clothes and they spake unto all the company of the children of israel saying the land which we uh, pass through to search, search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are uh, bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. So they said, we need to go in uh, and possess this land. Uh, Joshua is one of those that said we need to go in, Joshua and Caleb. Numbers 27, Joshua is ordained by Moses. And uh, we can turn there, Numbers chapter 27. And I don't have the, uh, well, let's see, verse number 15. Numbers 27, verse number 15, and Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, let, it, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not as sheep which have no shepherd. And so Moses is praying for someone to come in and to take his place. Verse number 18, And the Lord said unto Moses, Take thee Joshua, the son of Nun, a man of whom is, this, uh, is the spirit, and lay thine hand upon him. Um, and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And so the Lord, in answer to Moses' prayer, says, take Joshua. Um, it is interesting, it says, and lay thine hand upon him. The laying on of hands is a, a symbol of authority. Someone who has a higher authority would lay their hands on somebody who they would be passing that authority to, giving it to somebody else. I'm giving this authority that I have um, unto you. And so here we have um, Moses giving the authority, laying his hands on Joshua, saying you're going to be the next leader, um, as the Lord had, uh, had, had told him to do. Um, verse number 20, And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. 
Um, these children of Israel need to recognize the fact that you approve of him. The Lord said, I've chosen him. This is who you're going to send. But the people need to see from their already proven, given leader, Moses, that Moses puts his hands of approval on Joshua. You know, in a transfer of leadership, how important it is um, that, that everyone is in agreement with this and how important it is that the current leader that God has put into charge would recognize God's leading on the next person who would come in. Uh, and so he lays his hands on him in front of everyone so that everyone would see that, um, you know, uh, some of thine honor is upon him, that all the children of the uh, uh, congregation of the children of Israel may uh, be obedient. Verse number 21, And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word shall they come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge as the Lord commanded by the hand of Moses. And so God commanded Moses um, to give him a charge, and, and uh, he certainly did. Um, Numbers 27, we see Joshua ordained by Moses to be the next leader, the one that would lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 3, Moses prays for his successor. Deuteronomy chapter 34 tells us that Joshua is a spirit-filled. Joshua 34, 9, and Joshua the son of Nun was full of the spirit of wisdom. Uh, and so we see a lot about Joshua in the Bible leading up to this point, and we will see a lot about Joshua being used of God to lead the children of Israel into the promised land in the book of Joshua. All right, we are going to have a word of prayer and get ready for our morning service. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for all that you have blessed us with. Lord, thank you for this great example in your word of Joshua and you calling him and choosing him and uh, using him. Lord, I pray that you would continue to help us to learn from this example in your word of, of a great leader. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would uh, be with the services today. May we lift you up and bring glory and honor to you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. Uh, Lord, may we lift you up. Lord, keep you preeminent. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.